Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ME Drop In Midfix's brand new podcast. I'm Moj, your host, and I'm also the content marketing executive at Midfix. Um, if you don't already know, Midfix are a trusted supplier for the ME sector, um, but we also have an in house design and engineering team who design and engineer pipe and cable supports from simple trapeze brackets to larger scale two tier access platforms and things like that. But in recent years, we've kind of evolved our focus into best practice with the aim of shifting this collective mindset that we have in the industry away from procure, procuring solely based on price and traditional on-site manufacturing and a lack of evidence and accountability um, and move towards just a safer built environment uh, and compliance with the Building Safety Act. So how and why did we create this podcast? Well, obviously our main dem demographic are m &E contractors um, and, in, and tier one contractors, but in recent years, there's been a lot of changes in the industry that maybe a lot of them aren't aware of or they aren't aware of how to start implementing these changes within their projects. So we felt it was high time that there was an easily accessible hub of information like this because as of now, there doesn't seem to be many forums where you can have an open dialogue and discuss these issues and changes. And, and it all might seem overwhelming considering how many changes are happening all at the same time. So yes, we wanted to start something where we can have an open dialogue and hopefully help our customers and bring people who have um, expertise on these subjects to share their knowledge. Um, so yes, yeah, stay tuned. We'll be bringing a lot of different guests, hopefully, and uh, we hope you enjoy and find it helpful. Today we have Hannah Clark from the Construction Products Association. She's the Digital and Policy Manager. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's really good to have you. Lovely to be here. How are you? Having a magical day. That's great. <laughs> um, so for those watching who might not have heard about the Construction Products Association, why not tell us a bit about that and what that entails, what you guys do over there? Uh, the Construction Products Association, uh, we represent over 85% of the uh, uh, product manufacturers and uh, suppliers in the UK. Um, and actually, over 75% of all the construction products used in the UK are made right here in the UK. So we represent such a vital part mm -hmm. of the UK economy. And essentially what we do at CPA is bring together all of that knowledge, all of that experience and cons through consensus. And we feed uh, the information uh, up to government and, and government information back down to uh, our industries. Together, we collectively work on various different initiatives and projects that cover anything from building safety to sustainability to um, technical and regulatory mm -hmm. things. And uh, we have an enormous, uh, enormously successful economics team that uh, do projections for the construction sector. Uh, so we cover quite a few bases mm -hmm. within the CPA. Um, and if I'm correct, you recently released a white paper called the Built Environment Construction Product competence st proposed standard yes it's it's, it's not it's, <laughs> it's not a catchy it's title it's, I, I, i'm gonna put for anybody who's watching a video i'll raise it here here it is it's the built environment proposed construction product competence standard it's a white paper yes. on a proposed standard for construction product competence mm -hmm. and uh you are the lead author of this proposed standard. Lead author, but very much the consensus work of um, a working group called mm -hmm. Working Group 12 and many, many other contributors right across the built environment. Uh, amazing. Okay. Can you tell us a bit more about, first of all, what this proposed standard entails and why was there an urgent need for it? Um, and also, Working Group 12, explain what that is, please. Just Quite a lot of questions in that <laughs> one. Okay, let's, let's start off. Why is there a need? Um, now, fundamentally, uh, of course, the construction sector needs to change how it looks at competence. Uh, historically, we are not very good uh, at systemically recognizing what yeah. competence looks like. Um, and we're not necessarily always very good at also demonstrating it. And one of the challenges behind that is you know, lots of people say the construction industry, but in fact, it's neither construction nor one industry. Um, it's many different mm -hmm. industries right across the built environment, and we make a huge sector. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard for me to know what's going on in my company of 12, let alone another company in my sector, uh, um, in my industry. Yeah. And, and 
even then like what about industries which are up and down the supply chain it's it's very challenging so we've all got different reference points we've all got slightly different languages yes. essentially um so it's really difficult for us to be able to pinpoint what competence looks like from one area to the next and yet we're all joined up in creating buildings and built environments mm. so it's really challenging for us to see where those gaps and spaces are so uh, number one we have to really be able to recognize how to build competence as a joined up industry and sector but also from a motivational perspective why this is necessary really here and now um, particularly for companies that are working in england uh, we have the Building Safety Act. Mm -hmm. And the Building Safety Act came, uh, it achieved royal assent last year. And lots of people think that this is just about uh, buildings in scope. So by that I mean buildings which are over 18 mm -hmm. metres, residential. Um, but in fact, the Building Safety Act is way, way broader than that. It does have some requirements specific to that. But it's also bringing in, uh, well, apart from anything, two bodies of oversight, the new uh, building safety regulator and a new regulator for construction products. And the new building safety regulator um, has oversight of competence for everybody who's working on buildings. So that's, that's from your largest PFI, airports, hospitals, right down to just that conservatory add-on that you're popping on. So, you know, it, it's quite the spectrum. So the Building Safety Act is now going to be requiring a duty of competence on the entire supply chain. Now, that duty is placed on the duty holders first and foremost. So that would be the clients, principal designers, mm -hmm. principal contractors, contractors and designers, and accountable persons uh, for buildings in occupation. Now they have a requirement to demonstrate the competence of their workforce. So that's to ensure that all the individuals within their work workforce, essentially their entire supply chain, um, that you can identify that they're working within their competence. But importantly, you must also be able to identify that um, identify and demonstrate that they're not working outside of their ceiling of mm -hmm. competence. So that, that really holds a, quite a large challenge for companies right now. I think you would be very hard pushed to find a company that can really clearly demonstrate that, let alone be able to really clearly communicate it to others. So that's one challenge. Also, we have within the Building Safety Act the definition of designer, which is very reflective of that which is in the CDM regulations mm -hmm. at the moment. Where it's important... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just for the audience, can you uh, let them know what CDM means or stands uh, for? That would be the Construction Design Management Regulations. Thank you. Um, so that's very much about health and safety. Mm -hmm. Much of the Building Safety Act has been built to reflect the CDM regulations. So we've got things that we already know works in yeah. there. Um, I think this was basically why we wanted you to come on here today was because... Um, there's kind of this misconception that it, it's only for uh, really tall buildings or mm -hmm. it doesn't apply to us or it's fine, we've been doing things like this for a long time. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to push is that um, it's not about, it might seem overwhelming, but it's not about a sudden shift, like overnight shift. It's just about, you know, making sure we're taking the steps mm -hmm. to for a safer built environment, basically, for a safer future for everyone, basically. I think the the easiest way to recognize this is as a journey. The, the whole industry has to go yeah. on a journey. And government and, and, you know, the new building safety regulator totally recognize that. But it's only right that they set us milestones to achieve because we just simply cannot keep on doing this way. Mm -hmm. We know full well that um, our industry does not produce safe buildings. Unfortunately, yeah. Grenfell is a symptom of a much more, like, you know... A, Grenfell is a symptom of a far larger problem. Yes. So, but given that there is a journey to be taken here, I think you'll find that when the powers come into action, so for competence, that would be April next year, mm -hmm. um, 
you will find if the regulator has a look at a company that they're much more willing to be uh, forgiving of a company that is clearly taking itself on the journey, recognizing its holes, uh, than one which is doing nothing mm. and putting its head in the sand. So, um, although I can't speak for the regulator, I think I think this is where everybody has to go. What are the steps that we can take? Um, to make sure that we're clearly identifying the gaps in our, our in our demonstration of competence, which is why the industry has been coming together in lots of different ways to try and give give companies tools essentially to be able to do that analysis, to be able to do that work, and bring the individuals within um, their companies up to the appropriate levels to be able to carry out their tasks. Mm -hmm. For those who might not have heard about the building safety regulator, can you just explain um, why this is a concern for tier one contractors and ME contractors and just anyone in the industry? Um, what exactly the building safety regulator will be doing? The building safety regulator has several different responsibilities. Mm. So as I said before, yes, um, the Building Safety Act isn't just for um, buildings in scope, but there is a lot that the building safety regulator will be doing for yeah. that those building in scope. So they will be taking over the building control duties for gateways two and three, whereas gateway one will stay with um, local uh, building control mm -hmm. bodies in local governments. Um, and also what they will be doing is uh, looking at the oversight of um, anybody who's doing competence on any building. So that's whether you're uh, actually directly involved in the design, the construction, um, or the uh, 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 building when it's in occupation, or if you're any of those supporting industries that feed into that mm. work. So practically everyone. Um, so they will be looking at the competence of that. They'll be also looking at the overall structures of competence to make sure that they're appropriate. And they will also be looking into the, um, the quality of buildings. So that they've got quite a lot of different um, chess pieces that they're moving. Um, things that we should know about the uh, building safety regulator, though, that we can already um, identify. They sit under the health and safety executive. And that gives us some good clues. The health and safety executive uh, historically does not look over your shoulder mm. every five seconds, uh, but they are pretty good going into companies and pulling threads. Once they find something to unravel, mm -hmm. they do tend to crawl all over organizations like ants. So, you know, they will find any areas that you haven't appropriately dealt with. Um, and they do have a history of prosecuting to the fullest of the law. Now, this is important because previously, um, these uh, when, when somebody was prosecuted, mm -hmm. which would be very challenging to get somebody prosecuted when a, a building wasn't performing correctly, it would be a slap on the wrist. Um, now we're looking at unlimited fines and potential prison mm -hmm. time. So the, the, there's a far greater scope for something to be meaningful when yes. things are incorrectly done. But also the health and safety executive, they do do a lot of work to support the industry. So we can expect to see an awful lot of guidance. There will also be the industry competence committee that is going to be set up. I mean, it's already there in interim form. We will see the, inter, uh, the industry competence committee actually coming into play um, later this year in October and that will be bringing together uh, communities both from uh, our built environment industry and other industries that we can learn mm -hmm. from to be able to advise on policy directions and guidance. So you mentioned earlier that within the Building Safety Act they, um, it defines designer. What exactly a designer is? Can you tell us what that is? Yeah I mean I won't give you the full definition of a design that's quite lengthy. What I think is really interesting and, yeah. and why it's important to this particular subject mm -hmm. of construction product competence is that it extends to anybody making a choice about construction pro products. Now, that means that if you're making a decision about construction products, you therefore become the designer. You therefore have design responsibility and design liability. This is very crucial in the picture of what okay. we're doing. Because, you know, it may well be that 
anyone within that that whole supply chain might be making a decision. It could be a procurer, specifier. Who, it, yeah. well, a specifier. One would hope a specifier is a bit more clued up on this, <laughs> um, but it could be somebody who is a merchant or somebody who's selling. You know, it could be any of these various different actors who uh, make. A potentially small innocuous change or suggestion not knowing the full consequences of what that impact might look like because construction products very much work as part of systems and you know when you change one there are any number of inter interdependencies that could have a knock-on effect for the better or for the worse so it's um, very important within this picture that we all understand, okay, what are the limits of my ability to do something? Because you don't want to take on design responsibility unless you've got all of the correct information, yeah. the competence, and also, in many cases, the insurance. You know, you, you require insurance often for design responsibility. Um, companies can, will need to be far more careful to make sure that they're not taking on a liability that they, um, they don't have the appropriate uh, resources in place to cater to. So what you're saying is basically anyone who makes uh, any kind of decision when it comes to a con construction product will, according to this proposed standard, need to have a certain level of competence. But what exactly, because I mean, we were using the co word competence a lot, but what exactly does that mean? I mean, that's a great question. Competence as defined in the regulations. Mm is skills, knowledge, experience, and behavior. And it has to be a combination of all four of those things. Okay. So within our industry, it, we're kind of used to defining skills and knowledge a bit better uh, than... When it comes to experience, that's a little bit uh, more challenging to define. With behavior, we are not used to quantifying <laughs> that one at all. So it really gives us a, a challenge to be yes. able to combine all those things. Within, um, the, within the Building Safety Act, behavior is very specifically identified. And it is that part in it where it says that it's... Um, you must be able to demonstrate not only that you're working within your competence, within your abilities, but also you must demonstrate that you are not working with outside of that competence and that companies must demonstrate that of the individuals under their employ. So that is a really key behaviour that I think is going to change a lot of things. Yeah, and I feel like you might find, well, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that a lot of people, this might seem daunting that they need to have this evidence that they are competent. And, uh, but then again, it's been a long time coming, you know, yeah. and not only has the standard been in the making for four years, but just in general, yeah. things have been a certain way in the industry for a long time. And, and it just makes sense that maybe, maybe those things are outdated now, you know, but um, I imagine that a lot of people do actually can prove that they're competent. They just haven't actually thought to do that if you know what I mean like all you have to do now is just have the proof rather than just say and know that you're competent if I mean it, it's a challenge uh, I think is is that there's there are lots of and, and let's not say that we have a completely unskilled industry it's not the case yeah. and there's lots of places where people are competent to do their tasks but what are the limits of that competence and what is the upkeep of that yeah. competence you know I have a very good uh, colleague uh, who who is um, a chartered architect. Mm -hmm. They have personally handed back in their charter recently because they haven't practiced for nine years. Um, now, it wasn't required that he hand that in. He could he set said, up an architecture practice tomorrow, but he felt that wow. he no longer had that appropriate competence to keep up that. So you, there's, there's spaces where you can start asking questions and, and you know, if you pull the thread a little bit, it all falls down yeah. very, very fast. So, yeah, there. Are, I'm not saying that we're not skilled and competent in many mm -hmm. places. What I'm saying is that uh, it's one hard for us to recognize uh, what that extends to. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for, for me, I actually don't know what a chartered architect can and cannot mm -hmm. do because I'm in a completely different industry. So how do we, how do we communicate that across 
across the uh, various expanses and then just for an engineer i wouldn't be able to tell you what are they coming to do what are they not so one of the things we're trying to do with this um, proposed construction product competence standard is give us some all some similar um, pivots to to be able to uh, everybody can hook onto, everybody can hook onto at the okay. same space. Uh, before we get into specifics about the standard, um, can you tell us about the competence steering group and how uh, that formed the working group twelve? Yeah, so the competence steering groups. Uh, was formed back in uh, May 2018, following the publish of the Dame Judith Hackett mm-hmm. report, which if nobody's read the Dame Judith Hackett report on... Um, they must be living under a rock. Well, <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. I mean, it was such an integral uh, report for this industry and really, really looked at the fundamental systemic issues right across the yeah. piece. Uh, and I kind of think it's a, it's a bit of a back pocket piece, even today, even though we've been moving moving yeah. forward with that it, it's one of my favorite reports ever but um it's kind of the pioneer of all the other it things really that... is it really is um so the competence steering group was formed in direct response to that report mm-hmm. and um it brought together bodies and organizations from right across the built-in industry right from manufacturing all the way through up to um uh, in occupation and, and uh, uh facilities management so it, it represents an extraordinary coming together of the, the industries in the built environment sector. Mm-hmm. At the time, I dare say it was the largest coming together. Mm-hmm. And the intent with, with that was to look at uh, what are the routes we need to take to raise raise the bar on competence through uh, the entire industry. So mm-hmm. we've been working together for quite a long time. And it is very much an iterative process. Don't get me wrong. We we didn't immediately go. Ah, we we now all understand each other. <laughs> that didn't happen. We all had the ambition to work yes. with each other, but it it took quite a long time for us to start learning the directions from each one. And we're still working on that progress. Um, but there are underneath the uh, competent steering group, uh, twelve working groups that have been mm-hmm. set up, plus one which was called Working Group Zero. Uh, Working Group Zero initially set out um, an overarching structure for competence. And those recommendations were made in one of our first reports called Raising the Bar. Mm -hmm. And those uh, recommendations were all taken on by government and and the British Standards Institute. Um, And many of them to come to fruition. So we have a competence committee within the HSC, which has got industry inputting into it and residents putting into it. That structure has all been there. And we also have on the other side, a suite of standards being put together in um, the uh, in BSI uh, for competence and and currently there are four standards that sit in that suite so that's the eight six seven zero suite so if I just quickly go over those standards yeah. we've got BSI Flex version three eight six seven zero which is um, looking at the core criteria that any competence framework or piece of training or qualification right of the uh, industry, right across the industry should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's essentially a glorified checklist. And it also looks into essentially a code of ethics um, as well. What are the behaviors that individuals should demonstrate? So that's 8670. And then underneath those, uh, is 8671, 2 and 3, and that is a PAS for the principal designer, mm-hmm. the principal contractor, and those for who are dealing with building management for uh, buildings in occupation. Um, so those three set out um, the, the competence requirements for anyone who's fulfilling those roles or any organisation that is taking on those roles. So that's what standards have been set up. So this is all kind of work that has come out of the competence steering group in collaboration with as many people as we can bring on board or who have interest into this area as well. So there's that work. And then we have the work of the the working groups. So 
I won't go through all of the working groups, but for example, working group one is engineers, working group two is installers. And you, so you can see it's setting up a narrative of each working group looking at a particular occupational profession. And then you get down the line and you get to working group 12. And we're a bit of an oddball working group because, as I've already said many times during <laughs> this conversation, we're dealing with construction product competence, <laughs> which just impacts everyone. Yes. So uh, so we're doing a piece of work. And, and with that work being now put out, uh, and we published this white paper last year, uh, now the other working groups are slowly taking the work that we've done and starting to move it into all of the work that they're doing as well. Um, I, I, I think that's, this is a really interesting part of this story, is, is before we wrote down our competence proposals, it was much harder for us to look into integrating them. So we've still got quite the journey. We're doing this thing where we're putting out these uh, competence frameworks mm -hmm which is going to bring us up onto the first step and we'll slowly move industry in that way. And then we've got another journey which we have to go on, which is starting to take all of those and join them up together and make them closer and closer to something that everybody can, you know, interact with. So it's, it's been quite the journey with the Competence Steering Group. And we are currently looking to formalise because uh, right now we're just a whole bunch of volunteers from parts of the industry that wants to... Um, work together and improve the industry but we're looking to have a much more formal relationship with the building safety regulator and the industry competence committee um, that hasn't been uh, set in stone but I think it we're, we're in discussions okay so it's clear that it's very much a collaborative effort between all of these groups uh, how closely have the VSR been working with the working groups well I mean initially um, back when it was set up uh, the BSR didn't have that position. Um, the HSC uh, was doing its role as the regulator it yeah. already is. Uh, but from the very first day, uh, we had very strong input from particularly, um, as it was back then, MHCLG. It's now DLUC. Um, mm. And please do not ask me to spell out those <laughs> uh, acronyms. <laughs> DLUC is now, I think, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. MHCLG was Ministry of Housing. So, so you, you get my joke. Yes, I get They keep point. on changing their name. It's an issue. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, you know, they were the ones who were writing all the policy on it. They uh, post Graham Fowles set up a, quite an enormous department. The department expanded exponentially um, and the, we've always had an extremely strong relationship mm. um, and as they were coming up with policies we were responding to them and uh, informing them and, and vice versa so we've been very very uh, closely linked and we've been very closely linked to uh, BSI as well yeah. um, because you know everybody kind of has to be moving in the same direction um, the moment uh, the building safety regulator started being put together in shadow form uh, they started coming into the picture started Started having discussions mm. with us and what we've been seeing is a move away from the luck um, being part of the conversation as they hand over these responsibilities to the regulator and the regulator coming in um, so we're, we're seeing a transition and you know the regulator has a, their challenge to do uh, they've got to build up all of their own competences and bring in all of their own resources to do this. So it's been a slow, slow transition. Um, but I would say, suggest that the HSE have been uh, directly involved with consistency since um, it would have been before COVID. So uh, 2019, mm -hmm. late 2019, uh, they started coming and playing ball. Uh, so, but we are very, very much in strong conversation. We have to be. And also they've had the interim competence committee as well. Um, and we've had really strong relationship with them. And the, the chair of the interim competence committee sits on the CSG. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a strong level of communication that we already have. Okay. Well, thank you. That was very informative. I think maybe we should get into the <laughs> standard itself yes. now. So um, from what I understand, it doesn't actually stipulate specifically uh, to be competent in this. If you have this job role, to be competent, you must do this, this, this. It's, it's more so 
very dependent on what exactly that you do, correct? Like, what are, you, are we saying in terms of the regulations? Yes. Yes. Um, um, the regulations are very much uh, target driven. They're not yeah. pres- prescriptive. And I think some people feel like it should be more prescriptive. Other people uh, don't. My personal perspective is when you make prescriptive regulations, uh, you can quickly uh, move into an area where uh, it has unforeseen consequences mm. um, and it can take industry down all sorts Panic. of negative <laughs> yes it can ha- it can have a bad direction so the, you know the regulations have come in and they've set targets and the targets are essentially mm. you do a task you best demonstrate yeah. your competence do it that's essentially what it is and the duty of the, the responsibilities of the duty holders to be able to um, uh, demonstrate that their workforce is competent so it's not it's not saying we're going to tell you how that's yeah. done. It's going to say you're yeah. going to do it. <laughs> and so it is a task for industry to come and go, okay, how? <laughs> you know, uh, that's been very much the case. So, but we do have these targets that we must demonstrate competence. Um, and that is why uh, the CSG has been running as fast as we can to try mm. and set up a structure where we can recognize um, competence right across the piece Mm -hmm. um but i think what is really challenging and this is why i'm you know i'm obviously going to be a very big advocate of the wg12 paper on construction product competence (laughs) because spent quite a long time (laughs) writing it um but uh but i think one of the things that it can help with is because it's um different levels of responsibility and accountability within it it's going to really help uh, those with duty to be able to say, okay, uh, uh, this is this is a, a way that we can really identify competence on, on any myriad of of different levels and journeys. Um, Eight six seven zero is is fantastic, but what it doesn't do is really clarify. Uh, Eight six seven zero doesn't um, identify competence. Uh, within different levels of accountability and responsibility it's very much as I said a checklist and it's down to um, anybody who's creating a framework or training to say okay so if you're doing the task of installing this we make sure that we've we've included these things which are relevant to installing Uh, the uh, construction product competence standards and I will start saying CPC sorry (laughs) sorry to the world who (laughs) hates all of our acronyms it's got to happen I can't say it for much longer so the the CPC standard that looks at lots of different levels so right down from somebody who's just doing administration up to the final checker of of all things you know so it gives us a range and it also gives us some signposts it's flags in the sand admittedly but some signposts of okay somebody at this level is going to have to have come up to this standard but somebody at that level they've really got to come up to that standard and the things in between so uh, it's it's quite uh we're hoping it's going to be a really useful tool okay yeah, so while it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what you need to do, I think it's a really good starting point, I would say. Um, because even as someone who's not like, you know, I don't do any, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a content writer in the construction industry. But when I actually read through it, even though it might seem a bit overwhelming at first, the specifically the CPC core level criteria does kind of break it down and it seems straightforward. So... Why don't you tell us a bit about that? And Go on. Let's talk about... Okay. I'm going to, again, for all the cameras, <laughs> for those who are watching, I'm holding up our lovely standard. It is available on the Construction Products Association website. It's free for download. Um, it's not the shortest report in the world, but it's also not the longest. It's got lovely no. pictures. I do recommend anyone download it, read it, share it, discuss it. Um, it's really important. Why did we publish this in the first place if we're going to create a standard? Well, it's because we need something as soon as possible. Yeah. There have been enormous amounts of development which has gone into this. Um, and we also want to give industries the opportunity to test it as well for, uh, so that when we go through a standards process, we can really get some good feedback. But what is it? What's it? Let's, let's take okay, it right back go. down to this. Okay. <laughs> the CPC standard 
proposed at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, what it's looking to do is, as I said, it's a tool to make sure that anybody who is uh, using with, selecting, you know, otherwise working with uh, construction products, designing, you name it, uh, it's a tool to just check that all the training is in place, all that training qualifications or I don't mind how you put together your training. It's to just double check that the requirements are appropriate to the level of responsibility and accountability. Um, So that's what this is trying to do. And to do that, it has fundamentally five levels of competence. As I said, this is... um, This is down to levels of responsibility and accountability at the very lowest level. And and I say lowest level, but you're still 100% competent to do things at Mm -hmm. that level. That level might be the highest you'll ever need, Mm -hmm. but that level is really for people who are are doing work under supervision or uh, passing on information without interpretation from an authorized source. So, so for example, you could have somebody who is carrying out work on site and they've got a supervisor, but you know that would be have to be work that is very much uh, given full direction and attention, and, and and attention. Or you could pass on information. So that could be in a call center. It could be uh, doing administration tasks, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, that is the level where you do still need to know quite a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you know, it's still, uh, no choices. It's a no choice level. That's a choice, uh, no choice level. And then, uh, when you get upper stage, uh, that level would be level D. And this is the point where you start to be, ex- you can't make choices still. No, 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 <laughs> but, but you can make, uh, proposals. Okay. Can you say, so for example, you'd be able to propose, uh, so, so if we, with, if, I use I like to use the uh, the yeast spread analogy, which okay. is a bit of a challenge because I'm not competent in, in, in yeast <laughs> in spreads. But 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 you know, at level D, uh, if if you were, for example in level E, mm. uh, somebody can go in and say, I'd like some marmite. Level E can go, here is the marmite. Uh, or somebody might say, what are the ingredients of Marmite? And the level E person will be able to go, I can read it from the back of this okay. label. This is an authorised source. <laughs> That's what level E okay. can do. Level D, somebody can go in and say, I would like a yeast spread. Level, level D can go, here is our selection okay. of yeast spreads. <laughs> We have Bovril, Vegemite. We have all of those things. That's what, that's what you're doing at level D. But at no point can level D say, you want that one. Okay. Because we don't know what kind of sandwich you're making. That's a really good analogy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really important because uh, not only do you not have the appropriate competence at that level, but you also potentially, uh, well, mo- in most cases, don't have all the appropriate information either. If you think about somebody who's a merchant, for example, um, you know, they have people coming in and saying, what's the appropriate product with this thing all the yeah. time? Yeah. Well, you don't actually know the system that is going to be set up 100%. You don't, That's true. You're very unlikely to know what all of the different arrangements are. Um, you're being asked, actually, to make a design decision instantly. Well, you know, similar to how we've had lots of laws change for, for example, uh, for financial uh, liability, uh, we're coming to a land where design liability mm-hmm. is really similar. So you just cannot say you can do this one. You can say, here's a range. This is their direct scope of application. This is what the manufacturers say they can do. It is down to you to make a design decision about how you use them. So you've got to make sure you just step back, step back, mm-hmm. or step away from that one. See, when you put it like that, it seems like such common sense how can the person making such big decisions especially when you know health and safety is involved how how is it only a now thing so the consequences for when things go wrong you know normally it's going to be something similar simple uh when something's not performing yeah as well as it could um but you know when when it goes wrong when it goes really wrong we we've seen what the consequences of Mm -hmm. that look like uh so it's it's absolutely vital that we take what seems insignificant, small exchanges really seriously. It really is. Okay, so we were on level D. Yeah. 
Please tell me about level C. Yeah. Okay. So level C is the point where you can start making choices. Uh, so, but it's still limited. So at level C, as I said before, level uh, D, you can uh, you can propose products within a direct scope of application. Yep. What I mean by direct scope of application is the manufacturer says the product will do mm -hmm. this thing. Um, so it's really clear. They've stated the direct scope of application. In level C, you can design or select products within a direct scope of application. You can do some other things. You can um, also follow instructions or, or relay instructions within mm -hmm. uh, products with an extended scope of, a, uh, of application. But it's level C is this the biggest step up. You can start making okay. choices with construction products in the direct scope of application. And then, but it's only when you get to level B that you can actually make um, choices with construction products outside of that scope. So we call that the extended scope of application. And it's really important to have a, a quite a high level of competence mm. to do this. Because once you start using construction products outside of their direct scope of application, you uh, lose the benefit of all of the testing that has yes. happened with the manufacturer uh, from the manufacturer on that construction product. So um, that product will have gone through various different uh, testing procedures for it to be able to declare a performance, or at least it should have. If it's a, this is a separate subject, but okay. I'm just going to put this one in. Maybe it's a conversation for another day. But if they've got a uh, code for construction product information verification, tick, tick, um, then you will really know that that product is definitely doing what it says it can do. So what you really want to do is use a construction product precisely how a manufacturer is saying that. Now, it's not realistic to always use products in those ways, but level C okay. is when you've got the competence to do that. Level no. B, for you to use a product outside of that scope of application, you need to know um, is this the appropriate way to be using that construction product? Is it going to work with all of these other ones? Maybe I need to do some uh, industry approved calculations. Maybe there's actually uh, more testing that has to be done mm -hmm. with the direct combination that I'm looking to put together. Um, that will be very much according to what's the level of risk um, that goes on. But, you know, the important thing is, is that once you're starting to step away from the absolute known intended use, you've got to do some extra work, which yeah, requires extra competence. Yes. So that's where level B is sitting. And level A is about final approval accountability for all the information. Uh, it's the final tick. It would need to be somebody with appropriate competence that would be able to do something, for example, like uh, make uh, organizational decisions on design, mm -hmm. uh, substitution, for example. Uh, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be big picture people. We wouldn't expect to see level A people left, right and center. To be yeah. It's actually a I'm very high and, um, and it's, it's, it's quite a diverse mm -hmm. set of competences that are assisting at level A. You can do... All of those tasks, if you're appropriate at that level, that's the level you need to be in. And you don't need to extend past that. Uh, level A, we wouldn't expect to see a huge amount of them in, uh, in, in a company, let alone across the arena. So, uh, but you do need somebody who has that high level expertise to be able to be doing that final check. And, and I think this is an interesting place within this um, proposal because... My question is, is uh, the person who's uh, doing the last tick mm -hmm. uh, on whether that's the right product or not, do they have that appropriate competence to do that when it comes to the construction products? Uh, I question whether that's mm. always the case. Yeah. Um, it is worth noting, obviously, that uh, when you're level A, then you're also competent. You basically are also level B, C, D, E, right? And if you're level C, then you're also level C, D, and E. Yes, so they compound. So uh, we would expect somebody at level B to have the competences at yeah. C, D, and E. That is, a, that is, that is appropriate. Um, I think uh, what is also worth saying mm -hmm. when it comes to these levels, and um, I would probably have put this a bit earlier, but uh, I've jumped the gun. But oh, okay. Anyway, who are these actually specifically directed at? I think it's worth us speaking about the audience. So the, the 
every all the proposals within this standard are directed at um, anybody who is manufacturing so that might be um, also people who are creating marketing information uh, people who are giving technical advice uh, or making uh, uh, other decisions around uh, the construction product being put put forward into mm -hmm. industry um, anybody who is selling construction products anybody who's procuring construction products um, anybody who is designing with or specifying construction products, mm -hmm. um, anybody who is uh, installing them, supervising others, verifying construction products, uh, um, anybody who would be uh, dealing with handover information or management of information of construction products, anybody who's in the maintenance um, or decommissioning of construction products, it, it has that level of application. So uh, when I say it was applicable to everyone, I want it to be really clear, this is the range of application. That was not an exhaustive list. That was, it's that big. Okay, so we know exactly what the levels are now, but what are the actual requ requirements within them? Yeah, so every single level, covers similar topics mm -hmm. as it were so um at the the first topic that all of the levels look at is um responsibility and accountability okay. uh, and it is very much designed to pitch there first it is absolutely fundamental for us to know if i'm at this level what can i do and what can I not do? And quite a lot of the levels say, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> quite a lot of them at every point says, you can do this much with this competence, but you, you can't, can't go that. this much further. And that's very much reflective of trying to bring in better behaviours, to respond to, you know, the Building Safety Act as well. Um, and I think that's actually going to be extremely vital. Uh, as I said before, it's really important... Uh, and we're not so good at recognizing is saying we can do all these things, but it's, it's fundamental to this process that we know precisely what we cannot do. So accountability and responsibility is the first, mm -hmm. uh, first thing at every level. It covers what you can, what you can't do. And then every level goes through various other topics. So I won't go through all of them, but the, Obviously, we're going to be speaking about products in terms of performance and their characteristics. So at every different level, there'll be um, uh, requirements to do with those. But of course, they will be staged according to the levels. Yes. Uh, the, they will also be looking at standards and regulations. There are requirements about those. There are, and this is a really important topic, understanding construction products as part of systems and that also has strong application into um, uh, product substitution or value engineering. Um, and then there's various other categories, and they range things from insulation information, uh, service life and maintenance, which is a particular passion project of mine because my background is in maintenance and I'm always very sad at what gets handed mm. over. Um, and uh, other topics such as uh, warranties and guarantees, for example. And I think anybody who's looking at all of these topics is probably going to go, you know, probably could look down the level and go, there is absolutely no way I can do all of those things. But the, the uh, levels are designed to be able to be picked up by so many different parts of industry. They're quite holistic. And... Um, I will use the word again, it's a glorified checklist. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be so that you take the criteria and you make them, you, you choose them as what's appropriate to the functions that you're yeah. carrying out. That's where common sense comes in. I it guess. is, a, well it is, a, but you know, sometimes you can look at these and they look absolutely terrifying. I think what's also worth pointing out for anybody who's looking to um, identify which criteria are appropriate for you know, the functions that they're looking mm -hmm. at, um, it may well be that not all of the criteria are sitting in the direct level that you be, you think it's going to. Oh, okay. So I, I would often think if you're going to look at somebody's competences, choose the criteria first. Don't think of the levels, just choose the criteria. Mm. Go, okay, for them to do this task, they need that one, that one, that one, mm. that one, that one. And then where are the most of those criteria sit, where the most key criteria of those sit, that's your competence level. That's the overall level. Okay. 
I feel like this might be a bit of information overload just to those listening, but for those watching, we'll add a little visual here. Um, if you're a visual person, I think the tables would really help because, um, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of pretty pictures in, in, this, in the standard, but yeah. they're actually quite helpful. Um, so as of now, this is the proposed standard, but how do we feel about uh, this actually becoming a standard in, in the near future? How long do you think that would take or... Yeah, so we're in conversations with uh, BSI now. It has been approved um, as a recommendation for it to have been turned into a full British standard by um, the Committee on okay. uh, Built Environment Competence, so that's BCP1. Um, so they have, it's not, it's CPB1, so that's the Committee on uh, Built Environment Competence, that's CPB1. Um, and now it's going through the process of um, our putting together a uh, standard development group. Um, so we're just uh, in the last stages of doing that now. And then the standard itself, uh, we'll probably have it out for public consultation within about anywhere between, I'd say, eight months and a year, I think. Okay. And so... This is another reason why it's really important for as many people to read this as possible yeah. and try it out. Because what I really want is, um, by the time we put the standard out on the BSI portal for mm -hmm. public consultation, that we've had people who've really had the chance to grapple with these ideas. You know, throw them at the wall. I want to see what breaks. Um, I really need this to be as useful for industries as possible because it really is meant to be a tool to assist us. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm here for all the constructive feedback, bring it on. Uh, so I want people to look at it, test it. And then when the standard comes out for public consultation, I'm hoping that we get loads of really useful feedback. And then after that, it'll probably take uh, about six months to another 10 months, according to how much feedback we get uh, okay. through there for it to actually be published as a full standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I'd say is, you know, uh, the framework uh, within the white paper, what we set out there, the proposed standard there, HSC, do you know about this white paper? They are looking at it. They, they like it. <laughs> They've been very supportive. So has the OPSS. Uh, they're very much in support of it. So they're going to be sitting on the standard developments as well. So uh, we've got a long, lot of uh, governmental and um, regulator support for this. So if people are worried about putting in time mm -hmm. before the full standard comes out, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's <laughs> what I want to say. This is going to be heading us in the right direction. It's valuable work because, as I said... The requirements of the building safety regulator are coming thick and fast, and I'd hate to be uh, anybody who is hung out here. Yeah. Okay, well, speaking directly to our audience, because our demographic is, even though this applies to everyone, obviously our demographic is mainly m and &E contractors. Mm -hmm. So while, while we're waiting for the standard to come out, what do you think they can do as of now to prepare for it? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Obviously, M&E has uh, its own huge range of construction products. I think it's worth defining what I mean about construction products. Uh, what, what does that actually mean? Uh, we consider a construction product to be anything that is placed on the market and marketed for the use of within construction. Mm -hmm. so, Which is very broad. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is it's quite broad. So, of course, it, 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 it could... It can be from like this, you know, fairly unrefined materials all the way up to very uh, complicated systems. So obviously, m and &E is very much within that category. And then uh, you need the competence to do all of that work to put it together. And, and I think uh, anybody who's worked within that particular space knows how much can it go wrong in so many different spaces when you're trying to do that piece of work. So the competences uh, of construction products is 100% applicable to this arena. So what I would suggest is companies have a look at this, read this standard. Um, you can uh, start looking within yourself, in your, in your organization, um, and start identifying what are the functions we have. So it might be people who are designing, it might be somebody who's installing, you know, identify what are the, the functions we have, what are the products we use. 
do we actually demonstrate construction product competence? If not, this is the place to go. Um, and you mentioned that you have a support group for those who might need a bit of guidance, because obviously, you know, you might need it. <laughs> yes, um, and it's, I think it's really important because we're all we're we're all uh, on the same journey, yeah. as it were. So, I, yeah, the, the CPA we have um, what we call the CPC support group. Um, so that's the construction product competence support group mm -hmm. and that's open to anyone I'm I'm not keeping it to CPA members you can be a teeny tiny company you can be an enormous company you can be a trade association you can be in HR you can be technical if you are concerned about this you've read the white paper you want help assimilating it you want to go by all means give me an email I'm sure you will have put my contact yes, details <laughs> there um, yeah, we hold a monthly meeting and it is open to anyone and everyone. And it's really a space for people to throw topics into the, into the, um, into the room. Mm -hmm. Other people are dealing with the same problems that everyone else is. So we're, uh, it's a space to share knowledge and, uh, you know, wherever possible, uh, provide some guidance and support. So we clearly have a long way to go, but, um, just, just your opinion, what, if there was one thing you could change about the industry right now, today, tomorrow, what would it be? DMB contracts, gone. Ax them. <laughs> Get rid of them. I'm fed up of them. They're no good. They're no good in this transition of change that we're trying to implement. I need an industry that can actually quote for quality, you know, put, you know tender for quality work. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. I'm looking for industries not to feel like they are fighting in a marketplace. Um, for the cheapest, uh, fastest contract, uh, uh, you know, and realistically, we are entering um, a phase where we're going to have on one side, you know, these regulations that don't look quite real yet. <laughs> and on the other side, we've got the marketplace, which we have to, you know, compete in realistically. It's really hard balance. The reality is for us to work appropriately for us to to do these competent things and and, and provide the competent uh pr provide the quality that we like without doing you know switch outs of um of contractors and and products and all the other places where we can skim off the top for that to happen we need to um all lift our prices a bit so that we can do it so that we're quoting the right price now i think in the long run we're going to see a huge amount of efficiencies from this and i think we're going to see this being uh, becoming a much um more reasonable economy to work in because we're going to be working with people who are you know more digitally inclined, have all the appropriate competences, we'll have, be able to communicate. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. But in the meantime, I don't like me a DMB contract. <laughs> Get rid of them. They're no use. They just, in my opinion, they just exacerbate bad behaviors. Well, you mentioned the whole price thing. I feel like that's, that's one of the things that maybe make people a bit reluctant to, you know, start training or actually caring about yeah. competence or evidence. And that's one of the biggest hurdles we kind of have to jump over. Mm -hmm. So, um, but do you, how, how do you propose that the entire industry all at once will just raise their prices? Because well, obviously, I mean, I say, right. And it's very flippant. Yeah. Day, isn't it? It's, it, I know it's, it's such a flippant, raise your prices. Don't worry about, I mean, I think what I, I, I'd love for everybody to, to have, you know, uh, to be able to kind of think a bit better about their resources and how it, it, it was yeah. doing tomorrow. That's sure. But that's a wishful thinking. I, yeah. I, I, I recognize that. I think there's going to have to be a recognition. Um, you know, companies can recognize that uh, uh, this is this is forward thinking. Yeah. This is the place. Uh, this is the only way we can continue to okay. work within the marketplace because it will become that. Mm -hmm. But realistically, I do recognize it will probably... Um, I, I think you'll see change. It's, it, I think you're going to see people change when staying still is more painful. That's, uh, that's where I think it's going to happen. And so I think once we start seeing some consequences, and there will be, 
I think that's when we're going to see, see real change. But for, for anybody who doesn't want to be part of those consequences, I, I just I strongly recommend yeah. it's for all buildings. Everybody contributing to all buildings. That's, you know, they can go anywhere. So yeah. I think um, you, you either get part of the market uh, for, for the long run or you just step out of it because if you don't deal with competence that's that's essentially where you're going to be out of the market mm -hmm. I mean if you don't deal with it now then you're going to have to eventually so there's no point waiting around yeah. basically it's like climate change we know it's happening yeah, yeah. <laughs> just ignore it yeah <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Hannah. This has been such a good session. It's been um, a pleasure. And also, you're always welcome back, you know, if you want to do an episode on women in construction or Hi. whatever. <laughs> you're welcome anytime. So thank you so much for listening. Feel free to follow our page if, you're, if you enjoyed this episode. If you enjoyed, check out our last episode as well. And we'll be having a lot more guests coming. And if you have any suggestions on future topics that you'd like us to talk about, also feel free to drop those in the comments. So thank you so much. And thank you, Hannah. Bye. You're welcome. <laughs>